this has been a great joy in my life. I've loved every minute of it. Uh, my dear man, I've been on more world cruises than you could shake a stick. With her dynamic spirit, restrained sexuality, and refreshing optimism, Doris Day became one of the screen's most beloved all-American girls. Cast mostly in light-hearted films during the 1950s and 60s, she became one of Hollywood's top box office attractions. I never caught her acting as though it were difficult. When she came on the set, she was in control of what she was going to do, and it was usually dead right. If you don't get out of here this instant, Mr. Canary, or Mr. Calamity, or whatever your name is, Mr. You thought I was a man? <laughs> Come to think of it, that ain't so funny. Day's ability to perform on stage was a talent that came at an early age. At 12, Doris Kappelhoff and her fellow classmate danced their way to first place in a talent contest in her hometown of Cincinnati. With aspirations of becoming a professional dancer, Doris set her sights on Hollywood. But the night before her family was to leave for California, something happened that would shatter her dancing dreams. She was on a double date and uh, she was in the back seat of a car and the car was, if you can imagine, hit by a train and she had a couple of broken legs and during the recuperative period uh, really to give her something to do um, she began to take singing lessons Day made the best of her newfound talent at 15 she began singing professionally on the radio and in a nightclub run by band leader Barney Rapp by 17, she had taken her stage name from her signature song, Day After Day. She had also married trombonist Al Jordan and was earning a living on the road, singing with some of the biggest bands of the 1940s, including Les Brown and his band of renown. Just like that ship on my horizon, you see. She said Les was like a big brother when they were on the road together. Uh, and everyone in the band was you know, very respectful, and she really thinks of all those people uh, from those days as, as kind of, you know, family. But as her singing career flourished, her relationship to Jordan hit a sour note, and no amount of optimism could save her stormy marriage. In February 1943, they divorced, leaving Day as a single mother to her son, Terry. Three years later, Day walked down the aisle again, but this marriage was over after only eight months devastated she turned to Hollywood to help her forget her marital woes she went to a party uh, kind of a you know a quote-unquote Hollywood party one night and um, a songwriter named Sammy Kahn happened to be at this party and he had written the score for a film called Romance on the High Seas that Warner Brothers was doing and Doris happened to be there and someone asked her to please get up and sing and she did and Sammy Khan rushed over uh, and said, my God, this is, this is like Providence. You've gotta, I've got to take you to Warner Brothers tomorrow. You've got to test for the film. And he took her in to Warner's, and, uh, and she read for the part, and he said the whole place lit up. Still upset by the failure of her second marriage, Day broke down during part of her screen test for Warner Brothers. However, studio executives could sense Day's energy and spirit through the tears and they signed her to a seven-year contract. Although she had no acting experience, Warner Brothers took a chance by casting Day in the lead role of director Michael Curtiz's Romance on the High Seas. They had no reason to regret it. Day got high marks from the critics, and her song, It's Magic, became a million-dollar seller. When we walk hand in hand, the world becomes a wonderland. It's magic. Romance on the High Seas was the first of 17 pictures Day did at Warner Brothers. In contrast to the blonde bombshells who were popular at that time, the studio created a homespun apple pie image for Doris. There's a great line from uh, Oscar Levant, who did uh, uh, three or four movies with Doris at Warner Brothers. And Oscar Levant said, I, I knew Doris Day before she was a virgin. I'm asking you to be my wife. Your married wife? Oh, Bill! She just had all those facets, kind of, that people could recognize, and, and uh, 
associate with. They, they, they think, oh, yeah, I know somebody like that, or I wish I did know somebody, you know. Uncle Max, ever since I was a little girl, you and I have played fair in everything, haven't we? Don't you trust me? With my life. But this is money. I just flew in from the Windy City. The Windy City is mighty pretty, but they ain't got what we got. Day's 1953 role as the pistol-packing tomboy in Calamity Jane was one of her last roles at Warner Brothers. After her contract expired, she went into business for herself, forming her own production company with her husband of two years, Marty Melcher. Working independently, Day was now able to choose her own roles and broaden her acting skills. Playing tough-as-nails dance hall girl Ruth Etting in Love Me or Leave Me, Day surprised her fans and won over critics with a powerful and dramatic performance. I was a hit tonight. A big hit. It's a chance to be somebody. It's the Follies. It's Broadway. It's a chance to meet decent people and to make friends. It's what I've wanted and what I've worked for. Why should I leave it? What sense does it make? It doesn't have to make sense. It's what I want the way it's going to be. You can't tell me what to do. Day would go on choosing parts that differed from the happy-go-lucky roles she did at Warner Brothers. Parts that challenged her, like Alfred Hitchcock's The Man Who Knew Too Much and another thriller, Julie. Well, if this is what married life is going to be, then, then we have nothing. Absolutely nothing. And I can't bear it anymore, Lyle. I really can't. And I won't. You're hurting. Take your foot off of mine. Although Day starred in both drama and comedy, her biggest triumphs came from the light-hearted film she did in the 1960s. Co-starring with Rock Hudson, she embarked on a series of sophisticated comedies that took her existing wholesome image and gave it a sexy spin. Audiences responded to the Hudson Day comedies and the two stars became box office champions. I think they only did, it could be three and it might be four movies, but a lot of people think they must have done 30 because it became a whole genre and a lot of other people began making movies like that. While the beginning of the 1960s marked Day's best years in Hollywood, it all came crashing down as the decade came to an end. In 1968, Marty Melcher, her husband of 17 years, died suddenly of a heart attack. Then the unthinkable happened to America's girl next door. She discovered that her $20 million in earnings had been mismanaged or embezzled by her husband and his lawyer. She also found herself in a television series that Melcher had signed her to without her knowledge. Wanting justice against her late husband's lawyer, Day fought back with a lawsuit. After five years of litigation, she was awarded over $22 million. She also kept her deal with her television show, and it became a popular series for five years. I think the day that she finished the fifth year, she called me and she said, uh, am I right that I've now completed that, that obligation? And I said, yeah, that's the, that's the full extent of it. And she quit. That was it. She just decided to do something else. Now in retirement, Day lives on her ranch in Carmel, California, where she devotes her time and energy to the Doris Day Pet Foundation. Although she has stepped out of the Hollywood spotlight, Doris Day remains a favorite to audiences who still cherish her warmth and refreshing optimism. Happy birthday to the sweetest gal in Hollywood, Doris Day. See the grass bottom boat, please don't eat the daisies, and teacher's pet. Tonight, starting at 7 p.m. Eastern on Turner Classic Movies.